Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. If you can hear a noise in the background, it's just Jennifer playing on the landing with the toys. I'm in the bedroom this week, not in the library office. Just because all my reading books are in here. So I'm going to do uh, a quick book haul for all the books I bought in September. There are only nine. I've actually read most of them, it's great. So um, they're in no particular order. I bought Terry Goodkin's uh, Siege of Stone, which is book three in the Nikki Chronicles, A Sister of Darkness story. So this is following on from the Wizards First Rule series, uh, Sword of Truth series. This is the next series. I've got the first two. This is a second-hand library copy. I couldn't get a, I think we ripped a few pages up, but I don't care because I just want to read it. So basically the sorceress Nikki, the wizard Nathan Rao, and the young swordsman Benon are under siege. Having liberated the legendary city of Eldakar from the despotic reign of the Wizards Council, they now face the Council's final act of vengeance. An ancient spell has been revoked and half a million hostile warriors released from 15 centuries of stone-bound stasis. Surrounded, trapped inside the city walls, the companions must stand shoulder to shoulder with the newly freed citizenry to repel an ancient foe sworn to the destruction of their city. But Nikki, a one-time sister of the dark, knows that there is more at stake than just Eldercar. If she can't destroy the approaching army at the city gates, there is nothing to stop it sweeping across the old world and laying waste to the horror itself. So I have read the entire uh, Wizards First Rule uh, series. I'm going to start a reread of that soon. All Sword of Truth. I've read the prequels. There's a few I haven't read and I'm going to start reading this one. This one is on, hopefully going to be read at some point in October. Uh, then I also got The Bank Holiday Murders. This is by Tom Westcott. This is one of the Ripper Collection books. So basically with this one, Emma Smith and Martha Tabram were once considered to be the first victims of Jack the Ripper. Accepted wisdom changed over time and they're now looking more than footnotes to the Ripper mystery. But could it be that these early murders are in fact the key to unlocking the secret history of the Whitechapel murders? With new evidence and a fresh evaluation of the facts, we now find ourselves closer than ever to the answers that have eluded historians and criminologists for well over a century. So this, uh, for my Ripper collection, as you know, I collect Jack Ripper books as well as other ones. Of course, I had to get Richard Osman, The Bullet That Missed, book three in the Thursday Murder Club series. So it's an ordinary Thursday and things should finally be returning to normal. Except for trouble is never far away when the Thursday Murder Club is concerned. A decades old cold case leads them to a local news legend and a murder with no body and no answers. Then a new foe pay, uh, pays Elizabeth a visit. Her mission? Kill or be killed. Mm -hmm. As the cold case turns red hot, Elizabeth wrestles with her conscience and a gun, while Joyce, Ron and Ibrahim chase down clues with help from old friends and new, but can the gang solve the mystery and save Elizabeth before the murderer strikes again? I love these books. I got this one from the works Paranormal Stories by Jamie King. It's supernatural tales and unexplained mysteries are from across the world. Jen, not in here. Not in here! Honestly, she doesn't listen. What are you trying to do? Are you attacking the cat? What are you trying to do? Oh, okay. Very clever using your dinosaur to get that. See you in a bit. Shut the door because the cat's in here. Right, so paranormal stories. <sighs> Sorry about that. Did you hear about the honeymooners who were abducted by aliens? What about the woman who woke up in a parallel universe? Do you know the legend of the haunted lighthouse? What do you think? Okay, sounds good. Prepare yourself for some startling revelations and eerie accounts in this compendium of the world's scariest and most mysterious paranormal stories. Delve into a world full of supernatural beings, spooky tales and unexplainable occurrences, including ghost spirits in the undead, witchcraft and occultism, aliens and UFOs, legendary and mythical creatures, Zombies, werewolves and vampires, time travel and alternative realities. Whether you're a believer or a sceptic, a paranormal junkie or an interested observer, let the stories in this book spark your imagination, capture your curiosity and perhaps even send a shiver down your spine. That was only £4 in the works. Love the works. I got my classic for October, which is H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. Look at this cover, gorgeous. It's a slim volume, so it's not going to take me long to read that. 
We all know the story of the War of the Worlds. Martians invade. We fight back. They die of the cold. <laughs> Basically, that's the story. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that one. As you said, I just put that on my to be read pile for this month. I bought The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. As you know, I've read only one other TJ Klune book, which is The Lightning Struck Heart, which I absolutely adored. So he expected nothing, but they gave him everything. Linus Baker leads a quiet life. At 40, he has a tiny house with a devious cat and his beloved records for company. And at the department in charge of magical youth, he spent money dull years monitoring their orphanages. Then one day Linus is summoned by extremely upper management, given a highly classified assignment. He must travel to an orphanage, I do apologise, where six dangerous children reside, including the Antichrist. There, Linus must somehow determine if they could bring on the end of days. But their guardian, charming and enigmatic Arthur Parnassus, will do anything to protect his wards. As Arthur and Linus grow ever closer, Linus must choose between duty and his dreams. So that's that one. I bought Salman Rushdie's Midnight Children. I have never read any Salman Rushdie, so I thought now would be a good time to, to start and uh, go a bit highbrow, book a prize, booker of bookers. Um, basically, the, it basically is this, a Salim Sinai, the hero of Midnight's Children, is one of the thousand and one children born in India at the moment of its independence from British rule. The moment, in the words of its first Prime Minister, Jawal Nahur, Nehru, excuse my pronunciation, when India had her twist with destiny. The twists and turns of this destiny form the springboard from which Salman Rushdie launches into his celebrated fantasia of our modernity. At once a fairy tale, a furious political satire and a med mediation, no, meditation on the ways in which time and change both shape and are shaped by the life of a single individual. Midnight's Children announced the triumphant return of epic storytelling to our highly evolved literary tradition and it was voted the Booker of Bookers in 1993. So it's a beautiful edition, every man's edition. It's just red underneath. But it has got these beautiful every man gold in there. Um, so that's that. It's a bit highbrow for me, you know me. Two more. I didn't buy much, I was good. Of course I had to get the new Peter James, which came out at the end of the month. Picture you dead. So this is Roy Grace, book 18. So Harry and Freya, an ordinary couple, dreamed for years of finding something priceless buried among the tat at a car boot sale. <coughs> it was a dream they knew in their hearts would never come true, until one day it does. They buy a drab portrait for £20 purely for its beautiful frame, planning to cut the painting out. Then studying it back home, they notice that there appears to be another picture beneath of a stunning landscape. Could it be a long lost masterpiece from the 1770s? If so, it could be worth millions. One collector is certain it is genuine, someone who stops at nothing to get what he wants. Detective Superintendent Roy Grace finds himself plunged into the unfamiliar and rarefied world of fine art. Outwardly, it appears a respectable, gentlemanly above reproach. But beneath the veneer, he rapidly finds that greed, deception and violence walk hand in hand and Harry and Freya are about to discover that their dream is turning into their worst nightmare. <laughs> Love Peter James. I'm still trying to collect his back catalogue as well. I haven't read them all. I know they recently released Perfect People in Hardback. I've actually got an original hardback. Um, I want them to re-release some of his older stuff as well. So if you're watching this, publishers of Peter James, please, please do a hardback of Prophecy. It's my favourite. I love Prophecy. Please do it. I would love a hardback of that. And the last book I bought will probably be the saddest book when I read it. And it's Terry Pratchett, A Life with Footnotes, the official biography by Rob Wilkins. So, let's, oh, look at the end papers, aren't they gorgeous? Very 70s wallpaper vibe for that, or carpet vibe. So Terry Pratchett, creator of the phenomenally best-selling Discworld series, was known and loved around the world for his widely popular books. I'm tearing up just reading this. His brilliant satirical humour and for the humanity of the campaign work, because he did a lot of that. But that's only part of the picture. At the time of his death, in 2015, he was working on his greatest story yet, his own. The story of a boy who, aged si at age six, was told by his head teacher that he would never amount to anything and spend the rest of his life proven him wrong. Who walked out on his A-levels to become a journalist? 
encountering some very dead bodies and the idea for his first novel before he reached 20, who celebrated his knighthood for services to literature by forging himself a sword. Tragically, Terry ran out of time to complete the memoir he so desperately wanted to write. But now, in the only authorised biography of one of our best-loved writers, his literary assistant and friend, Rob Wilkins, picks up where Terry left off, and with the help of friends, family and Terry's own unpublished words, tells the full story of an extraordinary life. Mine's just the bog-standard edition. Nothing special about mine. I know there are ones with beautiful covers and pretty pages, you know, sprayed edges. But to me, what's inside, I'm not one of those people who buys a book because it's gorgeous. I buy it because I want to read what it is. If it looks great as well, fine. But I'm not going to go and spend a fortune just to make sure I get one with a pretty thing. That's going on this month. So those are the books that I bought in September. So do excuse my teariness. I can't help it. <laughs> so Terry, my love. Um, and that's already... I can't believe that. That's, that's all the books I bought. Not many at all. I will be back next month with some book, a book haul for this for October. There won't be much. I am cutting back because I'm trying to actually now try and get through as many as I can for the end of the year. We'll be doing it all again. Yay. Books rule. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this video. What are you looking forward to me reading the most? And to keep reading whatever you read, whatever it is. As long as you're enjoying it, that's all that matters. See you soon. Bye.